and the next speaker for this fourth plenary session is Dr. Rahul Chaturvedi, sir. He is uh, assistant professor at Banaras Hindu U University. His area of interest and expertise are British and post-colonial literature, youth cartographies, semiotics of culture, cinema studies, translation studies. He is in, he's editor-in-chief of Glocal Colloquies, an international journal of world literature and cultures, and reviewer of Sage Open and Gnosis. His publication includes diversified current issues. Uh, I have a very long biodata to read, but I'm just cutting it short. And I want to invite him for his deliberation on the very catchy and interesting topic, understanding fandom. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bandanaji, for your kind introduction. Uh, respected uh, Minakshi Pawa Madam, Sudhir Narayanji, Indrajit Sir, Shiv Narayanji, Dharmendra, Anubhya, and uh, other distinguished uh, scholars, students, fellow participants. Uh, I have divided my talk into two parts. In the first part, I'll try to discuss briefly, maybe in five minutes or so, what is cultural studies and how cultural studies looks at culture and how culture is defined. And then I would move on to discuss one significant aspect of cultural studies linked to cinema in particular, that is called fandom, the study of fandom, how fandom can be an object of critical inquiry. Uh, my talk is primarily meant for students, so, uh, so I'll, I'll begin. You see, you know that cultural studies, the origin of cultural studies lies in two very famous works, the uses of literacy by Richard Hoggart and culture and society by Raymond Williams in 1950s. And these two works were foundational texts in the sense that they tried to bring out a new mode of critical inquiry. In fact, scholars like Matthew Arnold, T.S. Eliot, F.R. Lewis, they have already tried to discuss what is culture, how culture can be studied. And if you look at the definition of culture provided by Matthew Arnold, which says, culture is the best of that has been thought and said. You know, if we take this sentence, ki sanskriti kya hai, jo kisi bhi samaj ke dwara, jo sabse uska parishkrit roop hai, jo socha gaya, jo the best of that has been, he says, the best of that has been thought and said. The best thought that has been said or written. So basically culture is either oral or culture is written and culture has to be the best expression of that oral or written communication. So that was one idea. In fact, T.S. Eliot also in his essay Notes Towards the Definition of Culture comments a lot about the decline of culture and also how uh, you know, culture needs to be distinguished from religion and also uh, from civilization and but how culture is an organ organic whole. You know, so the idea of T.S. Eliot was that culture is an organic whole. It grows into uh, uh, it goes it grows into a particular space uh, at a particular point of time so that was the idea so basically what I'm proposing so far that culture was basic the definition of culture which you can call a conservative definition of culture and conservative is no in no way uh, a wrong word or it has a pejorative meaning it has a very positive meaning also so for T.S. Eliot for Matthew Arnold culture was that which is refined which is what we can call Parishkrit, where culture is that which is, which contains what you can call sanskar, so on and so forth. That was the idea. Now when Raymond Williams and Hoggart, they discuss culture, they talk about, you know, the crisis in literary studies. In fact, uh, you have to understand that 
with them the definition of culture the idea of culture the concept of culture gets a transformation so what culture becomes then basically what they do they produce the democratized and socialized conception of culture culture do not remain what matthew arnold called the best that has been thought and said it does not uh, re remain the pinnacle or the summit of uh, human civilization it does not remain the ideal of perfection you see and that's why with this the idea of art also changes and art no longer remains something sublime something great and that's why with the coming of cultural studies it becomes very difficult to point out which author is a great author whether shakespeare is great or somebody writing some poem on facebook is a great writer you know it's it's, it's very difficult it's very challenging all right so basically you know what happens uh you see what they do they propose that cultural studies is out rightly political you know that is one idea which they argue and you have to understand the ideological positioning of cultural studies cultural studies is rooted into left liberal discourse all right and that and why because they talk about exclusion injustice prejudices that they observe or that they find out in society all right it can be caste injustice it can be class injustice it can be uh, injustice based on uh, religion or it can be any other criteria so cultural studies basically uh, is political in the sense that it is critical all right so one important feature of cultural studies is that it is highly critical and it is positioned into left liberal discourse that i'm talking about the origins then another important aspect or trait of cultural studies is that it privileges human experience you know whether your experience or my experience it does not matter that i speak from the dais or from the podium and therefore my experience is more important than your experience all right and therefore there is no difference many a times cultural studies scholars propose that the difference you see for example uh, dharmendra is sitting here he has worked on ram lila and how ram lila is viewed by perceived by those ordinary people who for whatever reasons visit ram lila every year they are called namis all right and see their experience how they look at ram lila i am a professor in university it's not necessary that my experience of ram lila is going to be the same or similar experience all right so provided by matthew or not that is the best of that has been thought and said that is being challenged by cultural studies scholar so i think uh, i i hope uh, uh, i have made my first point clear that this is how you see so there has always been a culture that's what you have to understand since the beginning rock art prehistoric times there will always if there are humans there will be a culture but cultural studies as a specific academic discipline emerged in 1950s and its objectives its goals its agendas were set they were very distinct all right and what it did that it challenged the notion of elitism it challenged elitism it challenged the notion of high art and low art what it did it transformed everything into text all right so how this mic is positioned how you know for example how this hall is located how this hall is constructed that can also be an object of study for example we stand here on a very high podium all right you like your position is a bit lower so you see why this construction why this structure all right so culture studies scholar can bring anything and everything under the sun into the object of their critical inquiry and basically as i told you it began with uh, the crisis which was seen by raymond williams and hogarth and others uh, into literary studies you know the problem with you know who is a great author you know great canon who will constitute like who will should be canonized who should not be canonized what should be the parameters of canonization how can the greatness be defined so on and so forth and basically it changed the notion of culture so uh, now the last point that i'll make and then i'll move to uh, fandom so basically you know what they argued so what is culture now so culture studies so from culture studies now we move to culture so what is culture so culture is uh, you know it can be defined variously you know that culture can also be there are different uh, uh, there can be different meanings of culture culture can be samskar culture can be preparation culture can be perfection culture can be determination culture can be formation all right so there are different meanings 
and all together what you have to understand that culture can be defined as a way of life all right whether your way of life or my way of life one basically whether the dominant uh, way of life or counter cultural or non dominant way of life whether quote unquote superior because no culture can be superior in that sense so whether supposedly superior uh, uh, culture of supposedly dominant class or even those uh, cultures which are counter cultures or which are non dominant cultures cultures of the ma uh, marginalized cultures of the oppressed cultures of you know so on and so forth so basically what happens to culture i i quote williams and i william says culture is not a practice nor is it simply the descriptive descriptive sum of the moves mo mores and folk ways of societies as it tended to become in certain kinds of anthropology it is threaded through all social practices is the sum of their interrelationship the question of what then is studied and how resolves itself the culture is those patterns of organizations those characteristic forms of human energy which can be discovered as revealing themselves in unexpected identities and correspondences as well as in discontinuities of unexpected kind so now if you look at this definition given by raymond williams it's very clear that culture is the process of meaning making how you make meaning how i make meaning and how our process of meaning making is interrelated all right so basically anything that you do the way you stand the way you talk for example if imagine for a while that you know uh, uh, i am not hetero heterosexual imagine for a while that i am homosexual my body my body will become a text and my body will perform differently imagine for a while that i am not a boy i am a girl my body movement the way i sit the way i walk the way i talk will also change accordingly so you see what is happening culture is inscribed into everything even into our bodies into our minds into our consciousness into our soul so basically culture is the process by which all social interactions take place and also culture is constitutive of those social practices as well as it is constituted by those social practices all right so you see uh, this brief definition uh, of culture studies I, i i gave you just to make you understand that you know what i am going to discuss today that is fandom it was uh, not i think 30 years before 40 years before it could not be an object of a literary inquiry although it is started in 1990s in the west in india it has uh, uh, just started to emerge so uh, you know uh, you must have come across the words like chamcha bhag and bhag so on and so forth and all these words are interchangeably used by different political parties uh, i am not into politics so i am not interested into that i am interested in, into only academic as aspects so you know uh, that you know fandom is all about hero worship you know who is your hero you, if you have read the essay by carlyle carlyle talks about hero as prophet as divinity Uh, as as priest as king as man of letters so on and so forth so basically he talks about hero worship now now what is the nature of those people who are hero worshipers for example if i if you ask me to worship you i will not worship you all right why because i would not consider you worthy enough of worship all right and if uh, you uh, if i ask you to worship me you would not worship me why because you would not find me worthy of being worshiped so what kind of people are worthy of being worshiped and who are those people who worship such people masihas heroes whatever name you want to give them you can give them so basically you know what i uh, 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 what i have decided to do in 5 to 10 minutes if i have time uh, i'll discuss what constitutes fandom and who is a fan now you see uh in fact in some sense everybody is a fan of something or someone like maybe uh, of like you may be a cricket fan or maybe uh, uh, a fan of a cinema star or a fan of political leader or fan of a particular guru or baba so on and so forth uh, all of us are in fan in some ways but what is the meaning of fan see fan jenkins in his book textual poachers defines fan is a person with obsessive attachment for someone or something whose admiration borders on threat abnormality or stupidity now these three words have been used and these words are very significant one obsessive attachment for example you watch a film you like a hero it's okay 
But you see, if you create a temple of a particular hero, or you have cutouts and then you pour milk uh, upon those cutouts, you know, what will you call it? All right? So you see, obsessive attachment, one. Two, this obsessive attachment borders on threat. You must have seen a film like Fan, uh, again, Shah Rukh Khan's film, where fandom becomes, uh, the fan becomes so threatening. All right? So threat is another important aspect. Then uh, abnormality, like, like you see, abnormality means some kind of insanity, some kind of madness is essential for becoming a fan. Like for example, I like a particular politician, whatever you say, I would not listen to you because I like that, so a bit of insanity is required. And then stupidity also is required. So this is one way of looking at fan. I I'm going to challenge this, but I'm just telling you what Jenkins has written. So threat, so it borders on threat, abnormality, and stupidity. Generally, fans are considered to be pathological and deviant subjectivity. Again, I quote Jenkins. And uh, uh, basically, we know that fan is always an effect of a star. And fan is understood always, or mostly, unreflective, emotionally vulnerable consumer of mass media produced images. For example, there are adver advertisements, there are uh, uh, other things, they are prompting you to like a particular character in a film or like a particular person through social media advertisements, so on and so forth. So basically, what Jenkins was proposing that fandom is pathological. If you are a fan, which most of the fans would refuse to accept, all right? So fandom, as proposed by Jenkins, was pathological. And Jenkins has a list of characteristics of fans, and I'll quote that. He says, fans are brainless consumers who will buy anything associated with a program or a cast. They devote their lives to cultivation of worthless knowledge, place inappropriate importance on devalued cultural material, like they are searching for those knowledge which, are, which have no cultural value, are social misfits who have become so obsessed with the show that it forecloses other types of social experience. They are usually feminized or desexualized through their intimate engaged with, with mass culture. They are infantile, emotionally and intellectually immature, unable to separate fantasy from reality. Now these are the traits identified Jenkins in his book, Textual Poachers. That's how he defines fans. Now see, if you look at this definition, you will find out that you know this definition of fan is quite moralistic. It is, it, 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 as I told you, it is pathological. Uh, it has, it, it is pathological approach, and basically, it considers that fans are cultural dopes. They are childlike. They need to be protected. All right. They do not have enough mind. All right. They do not have enough brain. So that's one way of looking at it. And what they are doing is not of any value, not of any importance. All right. It should not be given given any serious consideration, and therefore, it cannot be the subject of critical inquiry in literary studies or in academia. That was the usual argument. But there can be another approach. I think I have five minutes to sum up or two minutes. Oh, so basically there can be uh, uh, another approach, you know, I think that, that's how I'll, I'll, I'll end. So there can be another way you look at fans. You see, uh, most of us would not agree with this definition of fandom or fan given by Jenkins. Why? Because now we know that fans also have creative and communicative capacities. And if you look at fan communities on digital uh, uh, media or in, on social media, they are so powerful and they are so creative that they have potential and power even to form governments. Forget about, you know, uh, and if you consider them uh, brainless consumers, uh, duped by mass media, you are making a huge mistake. And basically it is an intellectual elitist bias that you have towards fans. All right, because they also have power, not only, uh, I'm saying the power is of course not unlimited, uh, yet they have limited power to transform even the life of the hero. In fact, hero is duty bound to speak what they want their hero to speak. All right, that kind of creative and communicative capacity these fans have. And this was, this is what, we, I think th that's why, uh, basically in this emancipatory model of fandom, you will find out that they're, like fans are no more isolated viewers, isolated audience. They have formed their own uh, communities. And what they are doing, basically it is called, it is called the subcultural model. So in this model, uh, like fans are the elite fraction of the larger audience of the passive consumer. So like we are calling fans what? 
brainless consumers but what they are they are elite fraction of active consumers only those uh, individual like like we are consuming everything they are actively participating into that discussion and basically they are appropriating the idea of hero also and they are also granting some kind of uh, subjectivity <coughs> and therefore i'll end my talk by arguing that you know uh, we can uh, look at how fandom can be studied can be analyzed critically differently all right and how fandom has become very powerful especially political fandom spiritual fandom uh, uh, sports uh, uh, sports fandom or even uh, what, what you can call cinema fandom there can be other like like, like city fandom like varanasi is, is a has so many fans you know so many foreigners come to varanasi if you ask us we would never understand why all right but but there is something in the city which offers them something special which you and i may not see all right so what is that how that is created why mark twain is writing what he is right what he has written uh, how you know beat the famous beat poet uh, has uh, described varanasi as he has described all right so we need to take uh, all these things into account and culture studies offers us the scope to take anything and everything all right even your glasses even your uh, camera even your mic even your sofas can be an object of critical inquiry that's how it has liberated but it, there are certain dangers also the, 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 the real like the great one of the danger is that you know uh, uh, sometimes it can pose a limited degree of threat to quote and quote uh, the refined ideas you know so that also we need to take into account so i i must thank organizers for inviting me here thank you everyone thank you very uh, nicely you have defined that cultural studies dismantles the distance between high and low culture and you have talked about this uh, obsessiveness that is related with uh, fandom uh, you concluded with one thing that there is something connected with fandom uh, with varanasi so people are coming in a one way this is very good for all of us because people are coming to varanasi and we are very happy that uh, this international seminar so many people they have turned up uh, from foreign countries so fandom related with varanasi is doing good for us okay <laughs> thank you